So Anna, we were telling Paul that we um, uh, developed a set of questions. We we invited invited the two of you, our friends, to start this so that you can <laughs> you can help us learn if we're doing the right thing and how to do this. But we want to uh, basically present uh, present some interviews with people that we respect and enjoy uh, to our students and uh, um, kind of thinking about uh, that intersection of vocation and avocation in the future for them about opportunities that are available in the world of music and the arts in the future. And uh, so um, kind of came up with the idea uh, over the weekend, we're thinking about what we should ask uh, friends and colleagues that we invite and uh, kind of came up with the idea of uh, kind of trying to come up with kind of a set of uh, standard questions a la inside the actor's studio. Um, although they're not all the same questions, don't worry. We won't ask you what your favorite curse word is. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, come up with a set of kind of standard questions. So we'll, uh, we'll see, we've got a dozen or so. We may, we may see uh, how many of them we ask as, as you all talk, but uh, um, that's kind of, kind, of, kind of why we've invited you. Team, is that a good introduction? Great. All right. So question one, and I don't know how we want to, Rebecca, you want to, uh, are you our MC or should we, uh, who wants to go first and I'll start. Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, so we want to tell, tell our kids about various things you can do in music, which is John just explained that sort of. Um, so one of the first questions we have is what is your current position in the arts? And would you share the story of what led you to your current positions? Okay, Dr. Cobbs, why don't you go first? Okay, currently I'm the music director and conductor for the Tacoma Youth Symphony. I'm also the music director and conductor for the Everett Philharmonic Orchestra. I'm a guest conductor uh, for the Sussex Symphony in England. And I'm a frequent guest conductor in Germany and Poland. And so um, what led me to uh, these positions was actually by happenstance. I didn't plan on it. I was invited to come and, and be a guest. And after becoming a guest, I was invited to take the uh, permanent job. Shall I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead, Anna. Um, so right now I work at Tacoma Youth Symphony as both their education manager and as the conductor for the two youngest orchestras. And then um, I also teach um, at PLU and CWU um, in the bass studios. And then um, I get to also play. Um, and so I play in Symphony Tacoma and then also uh, Tacoma Opera and the Tacoma City Ballet Orchestras. Um, the, the path here, I agree with Dr. Cobbs. It's like, you know, opportunities open. Um, specifically how ending back in Tacoma, that was around the time that the economy got really squirrely. And so I moved back to Washington. And then um, I sent an email to Dr. Cobbs letting him know that I'd moved back to the area and saying, hey, if you guys need a base coach. And his response was, actually, um, we're looking... <laughs> We're looking for an education person. Um, yep. If you get, if you'd like to give that a try, and then kind of from there, everything moved forward from that point. Um, but it's that same idea where I just kind of reached out and said hello and caught up with him, and then there was an opportunity there, um, kind of waiting for me. That's great. That's great. Okay, I think Megan is going to ask the next question. Megan, do you want to ask the next question? Sure. So if we stay in order, I think this is for Dr. Cobbs first. Um, and I was wondering for our students, what academic steps did you take to be where you are in your career? Well, after high school, I uh, went to Wayne State University and University of Michigan. In Wayne, at Wayne State, I basically uh, wanted to get my education degree because you can, you can be a professional musician without an educational degree, but you can't be an educator if you only have the, the professional degree. So at Wayne State, 
I uh, majored in music education at the University of Washington, of Michigan, sorry, University of Michigan, I focused on, on conducting. And so those were my launching points. Uh, after my undergrad, I did two things. Uh, one was to win the conducting job as assistant conductor for the Detroit Metropolitan Symphony Orchestra, very fine professional orchestra. And along the parallel um, course, as an educator, I won the job to be band and orchestra director at Redford High School. And I had 300 students in band and orchestra, one of the top programs in Michigan. And from there, it just went on. Um, and then for me, um, after high school, I went to Central Washington University. Um, with that, kind of at the end of high school, I was a little bit burnt out and not sure what I was going to do. And so I went to Central and I got a base scholarship there. Um, I had intentions of becoming some sort of teacher, whether it be English or PE. And um, then when I showed up to register for classes, they said, oh, you have a music scholarship, here's your classes. And all my classes were music classes. And at that point I was like, oh, wow, it looks like I'm doing music. And so I ended up doing that and essentially just falling in love with my professors and the other people. And I had that kind of moment where um, really felt like I found my people with the music people. Um, and then my last year at Central, uh, I got lucky and won a spot in the Spokane Symphony um, and did two years there. And then at that point, I was kind of craving a little something more and uh, went to study with uh, Diana Gannett at the University of Michigan. So Dr. Cobbs and I have some Michigan connections there. Yeah, go blue. No blue. <laughs> and uh, so I did two years uh, with my master's degree. And at that point, my timing was good again. And they had the doctoral position open and um, managed to secure that spot. And then did three more years at Michigan um, to get my doctoral degree. Great. Okay. I think Ryan's going to ask the next question for Dr. Yeah. Bob. Yeah, thank you both for sharing so far. Um, thanks for being here on a Monday morning. <laughs> I'm the You're new welcome. face. I'm Ryan Whitehead. <laughs> uh, I, I teach band at Bethel High School. It's my first year. Uh, so I teach with great. John. I also teach percussion and guitar. So yeah, this has all been new for me. <laughs> uh, and I guess here I have a question for the both of you. I guess we'll start with Dr. Jensen. We're going to change things up. Okay. Um, if there is any profession other than your own that you would love to attempt, what would that be? What would you like to attempt? Oh my goodness, attempt. Um, well, I used, to, I used to really like marine biology. That was a passion for me. Um, in, the, in the midst of other times I've thought about, it'd be really fun to be an elementary school teacher. Um, just to see how brave those people are and to see if I could pull something like that off. Um, and so I think, you know, pretty much anything with people or animals or that sort of thing would definitely interest me. I approve of that answer. <laughs> how about Dr. Cobbs? <laughs> well, in uh, my undergrad, my secondary work was in sociology. So I have a a lot of experience in the social sciences. And in fact, I work for the uh, Wayne County Department of Social Services in Michigan uh, for a couple of years. So if I did not do music, I would have been a, a sociologist. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy people and getting to know them and trying to help them. So, I find that uh, sociology is very interesting to me. So here's the companion question to that one. <laughs> and we should uh, start with Dr. Jensen on this one, I think, too, because it's the, it's the companion to that one. Uh, what profession would you not like to do? If we said, here, here's your job, which one would you cringe if we, if we said that, it, that that was it? 
Oh my goodness, I'm trying to think. Um, I probably wouldn't like anything in isolation. So I don't know if you sent me to Antarctica to be by myself uh, to study, I don't know, ice. <laughs> I think I think I wouldn't, wouldn't do well in that situation. Um, other than that, if I always feel like if I get to be around people, um, I can generally make the best out of anything and find some fun in it. Mm -hmm. My turn? Your turn. Well, you know, I should write a book one day entitled All the Jobs I Had to Do to Get Through College. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm sure you can relate to that. <laughs> The job that was the most difficult for me was doing construction. That was hard work, digging ditches and, and taking a wheelbarrow. And, uh, you know, it's honest work, and I commend the men and women who do it, but that's not something I want to do for 40 years. And so if, if there's a job that I wouldn't want to do, uh, it would be construction again. Now, I did it and I was paid well for doing it, but I'd much rather sit in a nice, um, warm <laughs> rehearsal room and wave my baton around. <laughs> I, can, I can speak to, yeah, my, my worst job that I ever had was when I was in high school, I was a human collator at a print shop and uh, I spent hours, <laughs> this is before they had all the fancy machines uh -huh. and I spent, hours upon hours walking around a table in circles uh filling pamphlets essentially um for mail distribution so that would be a job i would never like to have again for sure like plus it's an occupational hazard you're bass playing with the paper cuts right <laughs> exactly that's what i tried to explain to my mom for sure <laughs> okay well anna speaking of high school if you were 17 again <laughs> Would there be like one piece of advice you would give to yourself? What would you tell your 17 year old self? Yeah, um, I, I, uh, somebody asked me this just last week and uh, I think my answer is still the same. Um, my suggestion would be is to embrace and enjoy my failures a lot more mm -hmm. and to not take them so personally. Um, I can remember, you know, a 17 year old self um, you know, if I didn't, if I didn't win something or if I didn't, you know, get something that I'd worked really, really hard hoping to make that achievement, I would be crushed and, you know, have that feeling of doubt. And so I think, you know, just being able to look, look forward and um, look to people who, you know, are a little bit older and to see them enjoying their lives and their careers like you all are. Um, that, you know, nothing is totally crushing and to, you know, really stay on that path and to enjoy those failures. And I think even as I, you know, at this point, I still have failures all the time, but it's all those failures that lead to our successes. And so to just have faith in the process and to, you know, find, find the light and the opportunity. And um, it's like, I have a very supportive spouse and I'm always reminded, like, if not this, then something better. And so... Um, just to just to try to enjoy that that journey. Yeah, that's a great answer. Somebody okay. write that one down. If yeah. not this, okay. then something better. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Cobbs, how about you? You were well. Again. The advice that I would give my 17-year-old self was to live in the present and not think about five years from where you are too much. Of course, you need to have a plan. But when I was 17, I had said, well, when I'm, when I'm 21, I want to do this. And when I'm 30, I want to do that. And when I'm 60, I want to do that, the other. Well, none of it came true. <laughs> uh, I, it would have been better for me to do the best I could and enjoy being 17 because it never comes again, unless you're 117. <laughs> uh, so it's best to be in the present, to be happy with all the accomplishments you're making, to learn from your failures. Everybody is going to fail at some point. The question is, will you learn from it and move on? And so I would, I would live more in the present. And while it's nice to have a game plan, 
and all the things you want to do for the future, uh, more importantly, it's, it's good to be in the present and put your full attention into what you're doing at the time. Yeah, that's a great answer as well. <laughs> no kidding. I love these. That's so great. So the companion question for this is, and we can go backwards because it's fresh. So Dr. Cobbs, how would your 17-year-old self have reacted to your advice? Well, a 17-year-old, a 17-year-old knows everything. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> and so my 17-year-old self would look at me very politely, shake the head, and go, mm-hmm and do exactly what the 17 year old did. <laughs> and so, some things you have to learn by doing. And you, you, can, you can give people advice, especially 17 year olds, because you know, what's a 17 year old? You've gone through college. I mean, I mean, sorry, you've gone through high school and you're the big cheese in high school. You haven't been knocked down in university yet. So you're on the top of the mountain and nobody can tell you anything because you're a high school senior. So they'll listen and they'll go, mm-hmm. But my hope would be that in the back of that 17 year old's head, as life mm -hmm. goes on, they'll say, oh, I remember this. Now, when my son was 17, I would tell him things and you know, he would look at me politely and do what he was going to do. However, some years later, he said, Dad, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. It's exactly what I told him when he was 17, <laughs> but now it's his idea. So, which is fine. I'm glad he thought of it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm right there with uh, Dr. Cobbs, and I can definitely remember my 17-year-old self, and I remember it almost daily when I'm teaching and working with students. Um, I would have definitely thought that my advice was amazing and that it was a great idea, but that I was going to do things my own way. <laughs> and um, in the midst of teaching to this day, um, I still have self-discoveries from many of my mentors where I'll be mid-sentence saying something to a student and then I get the back of my mind like, oh, dang it. Like, this is, these are not my words. These are the words of my mentor. And I totally should have done this 20 years ago. And so that's definitely a reoccurring thing. But, um, you know, I, th I think especially when we're, we're younger, uh, we do like to do things on our own terms and to experiment. But I think just knowing, too, that there's this whole catalog in there of all this amazing advice and mentoring and nurturing and education that we have and it'll come out over years to come um, uh, from my base teacher I spent five years with her at Michigan and I learned a lot there but I learned the most once I actually started teaching myself and it was just this constant about 10 years of just aha movements and I would email her and tell her thank you and apologize for not listening to her before hey Ryan I I knew everything Thing when I was 17 and I still do. <laughs> Trumpet play. Um, <laughs> you're close. Oh. You're very close. <laughs> um, trombone actually. Uh, so speaking of the arts, speaking of trombone and the arts, um, so you both work in the arts. You have awesome experiences. Um, could you share like what are your favorite things? What are your favorite opportunities? while working in the arts. Well, let's start with uh, Dr. Jensen. Um, favorite opportunities, it, it varies. I get to wear a few different hats. And so some of the, my favorite things that I get to do, of course, are um, like going out to the schools, uh, meeting new students. I love hanging out with my friends who are teachers. Um, that's like such a huge moment for me to get to see people. Um, Mrs. Palandini and I were college roommates. And then for us to come back full circle uh, a few years later and get to work together has been such a blast. Um, so that's a lot of fun. Um, I love seeing my students do well and they come back to visit me. Um, that just makes everything worth it. Um, and then playing, um, some of the most fun playing I get to do. I love playing in the symphony and the opera and the ballet. 
Um, but doing some of these more wild shows like uh, up at the Paramount or at the fair um, where I get to play like video games live um, and step out of my comfort zone. That's a lot of fun um, getting to play some of the touring shows. That's a lot of fun. You get to feel like a kind of like a rock star in the background for a day. And so those are all exciting things. Video games live would be a dream come true for me. Seriously, <laughs> <laughs> I would geek out about that. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. How about, yeah. <laughs> all right. How about Dr. Cobbs? Well, for me, it might not be something that you think about, but when I was first working for the Edmond School District, uh, they chose me to work with the sixth grade honor band. And when we had our concert, I was so proud of them because we did eight bar phrases. We did eight bar phrases. We did all of our crescendos and diminuendos and they played beautifully and they got a standing ovation. And so that was a, that was a wonderful moment for me. Another moment that I remember very well is with the Tacoma Youth Symphony uh, and our first trip to Carnegie Hall. We were very, very nervous, but we finished the concert and we got a standing ovation and four curtain calls. And so that was a huge moment. Uh, and then in Leipzig, Germany, uh, Bach, of course, uh, worked in Leipzig most of his life. And Leipzig was also a place for Mendelssohn. That's where the Gavant House Orchestra is. Um, when I first conducted in Leipzig, uh, I was the first American to conduct since World War II because Leipzig was a part of East Germany. Right. But once the, the wall fell, um, then they wanted to uh, bring in American conductors. So I came in and I did Beethoven's Fifth and I got a big standing ovation, played four encores. They invited me to come back four months later and uh, conduct Beethoven's Ninth. So it was a big moment for me to conduct Beethoven's Ninth uh, with the Leipzig Orchestra and uh, that was a, a defining moment uh, to me. So those three things I, that stand out, my little sixth graders, uh, Tacoma Youth Symphony, and Beethoven's Ninth in Leipzig. Awesome. All right, our next question, uh, Dr. Jensen, let's go back to you again. Uh, to start this one is, what is your favorite word Probably awesome. Awesome is a word that I use constantly and all the time, whether it be starting out an email or a text message or working with people. Awesome. Uh, I feel like it can be used in the sense of like, that was really great. Or I can even use it as like, awesome. That's going to be really good for us to work on. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of a, an icebreaker um, and probably something that I use a little more often than I should. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Cobbs, how about you? Well, it's not a word that I use very often. And uh, I had a, a conducting teacher who was a famous conductor, Chelly Badaki, and had a master class with him for five weeks. And his famous quote was, there are a million no's, but there's only one yes. And so my favorite word is yes. <laughs> Don't say it very often, <laughs> but when I do, it's a great feeling. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's, that's great. great. That. Okay, Dr. Cobbs, um, yes. the opposite of that question, what's your least favorite word? <laughs> least favorite. My least favorite word is maybe. <laughs> because uh, that's not a commitment. Yes, I will try to do it or I will work on it. No, I will not do it. Maybe is, uh, there's, there's no commitment to maybe. Uh, although perhaps 
can be used, but when people say, I don't know, maybe, uh, that's my least favorite, favorite word, maybe. maybe. Make a commitment, yes or no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that's a good answer. Hey, Ian, how about you? Uh, mine, mine would probably be can't. Um, there's two of them. One of them would be can't. That word just drives me bonkers. And so a lot of times I'll correct them with dot, 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 yet. Um, and so I think that's always important to remember. And then the other one would be uh, B-U-T is um, a lot of the times a student will say, yeah, 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 I'm totally going to do that. But... Um, and so that one kind of drives me bonkers too, where it's kind of in that same path as Dr. Cobb is like, just commit. And, you know, either you're going to do it or you're not. And so, you know, really walking that path and, you know, be all in or, you know, and maybe don't bother. And so really committing to what we're doing. Yeah. Okay, Megan. Okay. So we'll go in reverse order again and I'll start this with awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Jensen, what characteristic do you most respect or admire in a person? Oh, my goodness. Um, a positive attitude would be, like, the top um, choice. Um, Dr. Cobbs, I'm going to steal this from him, he uses the word teachable a lot. Um, and so, you know, kind of with that, not necessarily teachable, but workable. And um, I've seen this happen a number of times, um, and I, I think other people admire this. Um, just a short story for your students. Um, I have a close family friend, a young woman who played oboe in high school, and she is passionate about it. Um, didn't really take lessons. Uh, you know, her parents are always kind of like, yeah, I don't know if this is your thing. Um, she moved down to Arizona last year, got a job started taking oboe lessons with the university teacher. She now has a full ride scholarship to Northern Arizona University um, and will be getting a music ed degree. And so, you know, with, with her really, really admiring her positive attitude and the, the I can do effort. And it really led her to an amazing thing that just happened. That's great. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, Dr. Cobb, same question for you. To me, I agree with Dr. Jensen. Attitude is number one. If you have a musician or anyone else uh, that has great skills but a poor attitude, and you have to decide between that person and a person with a great attitude but some skills lacking, I'll take that person with a great attitude because I know I can work with them and I can build up those skills. Uh, that person will not only uh, be successful, but they'll make everyone around them successful. If you have a person with a bad attitude, no matter how wonderful they are, they will not be a team player. Uh, they will not listen to suggestions and it's best not to to really um, have them be a part of what you're doing. So to me, attitude is the most important thing. That's number one. A good attitude. I like that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I can relate to that on so many levels. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm <laughs> so glad you shared that. Um, uh, let's how am I going to ask this? So imagine we're on a, we're on, imagine we're on a, a, a paradise island. Well, in a way we kind of are. So we're on an island. Um, two part question. If you had to pick one symphony composition that you could take with you on your island, you know, you can only pick one. What would that be? And have you started any new hobbies since we've uh, been on lockdown? So, favorite composition, and oh, have you started weird. any hobbies? I'll start with Dr. Cuffs. <laughs> well, since I was about four years old, my favorite composition was uh, Beethoven's Ninth. So my mother played Beethoven's Ninth for me on her 
record player, <laughs> her stereo. I was mesmerized. I couldn't move. I, I listened to it. And so that stuck with me throughout my entire career. I've conducted that piece now at least 10 times, but every time I find something new. And so if I run an island, I just find new things and new things and new things. And I'd be very content with, uh, with Beethoven's Ninth. I listen to a different movement every day and analyze it and find something new. Uh, and so what was the second part? Oh, sorry, the second part? Uh, have you have you developed any new hobbies lately? Especially no. since we have a different sense of time. <laughs> no, I haven't. I haven't developed any new hobbies. I've had more time to do things that I like. I've always enjoyed martial arts. I have a couple black belts, and so I don't have time to really uh, pursue it much anymore. But now that I have a little time, and you're confined to home, you need to to work on those large muscles. And so I get to punch the bag and, and let out any frustrations that I have. So that's fun for me. Um, yeah, I think to pick one symphony composition, this is like the hardest question so far today. Um, that's why I chose it. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is tough. Um, well, probably one of my favorite things to listen to in the classical genre be Bach, but I mean, there's like the symphonia, so I guess that doesn't really count as a symphony. So I guess my next choice would be some sort of Mozart. I feel like um, any Mozart, especially like his minor symphonies, like 25 or 40. Um, and to me, that's just something that I can listen to and never get sick of. And like Dr. Cobbs was saying, always kind of find new elements in it that uh, just always kind of refresh my mind and make me hear new things. Um, and then for, for hobbies, um, one of my hobbies has been, um, the rowing machine and I just finished the, the April Fool's challenge, um, where each day you did a thousand more meters, uh, topping out at 15,000 and, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, so that was something I tried this month. Usually I don't have time to do something like that and, uh, had, had made a, bet in my house wondering at what point would I question my decisions and it was it was right around the 10,000 meter mark that I really <laughs> questioned whether or not I wanted to be doing it but I did make it all the way to the 15,000 so thank awesome. you yeah <laughs> go ahead John all right so Dr. Cobbs let's have you start this one this is our last formal question uh the of our of our prepared list um, uh, so what are, what are you most looking forward to in the days to come after our uh, stay at home time, uh, when we get back to, uh, normal routines as it were and opportunities, what are you, what are you most anxious to get back to? What are you most looking forward to? I want to see my students again. It's hard not seeing your students. You, you don't realize what an integral part they play in your lives. And while you can learn virtually, it's not the same as being face to face. And so I've been giving them virtual exercises, counting down to the point where we can actually meet again and, and talk. Because, you know, there's so much communication going on with your music students. As you're conducting them, you look at their faces and you can communicate just by watching them and you don't have that opportunity. And when you're not with them, it's not the same. And so music is, a, is an art form that, that needs that communication, that face-to-face -face communication. And it's always evolving. It evolves from the time that you give a downbeat until the time that you give a cutoff. And so I'm looking forward to seeing my students again, especially my junior high age students because they're the ones who actually are the are they're evolving more than the older ones you know from grade seven through nine has a tremendous growth uh, potential and so they're different every week yeah 
So if you miss them for five, six, seven, eight weeks, they could be totally different people. So I'm looking forward to actually working with my students face to face and being able to joke a little bit and find out what they're up to, find out how their week went, all those type of things. That's what that's what's exciting to me. The music is great, but that personal relationship um, is actually even more important. Yeah, I too can't wait to get back to the, the students and feel the energy, um, have our breaks together. And I work with the, the second grade through eighth graders. And so I always love the stories of the elementary school students and what they have to tell me on breaks. And so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm also really, really, really looking forward to playing my bass with a group of people. Um, and just I, th I think just even like just the smell of the backstage of the Pantages, like I can still remember it. And I would love to wheel my base across the street and get in the freight elevator and head down backstage and hear people warming up. Like I miss that so much. And, um, you know, it's just not the same at home playing by yourself. Um, you know, it's like I can play along with my daughter and play along with recordings. Um, but really, really looking forward to sitting next to people and being back in that symphony orchestra. So you haven't installed a freight elevator at home yet? <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a new hobby. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, this has been um, absolutely delightful to get to visit with both of you. And uh, um, looking, really looking forward to sharing uh, sharing your wisdom and your experiences with our kids. Um, I didn't think to write this one down, but as we're wrapping up our formal questions, um, uh, each of you maybe do go back and start with Dr. Cobbs. Is there anything that we didn't ask that you wish we had? Uh, one other story that you think would be really good for our kids to hear or something specific that you were hoping that we would ask you that we didn't? Oh, no, I think you covered it pretty well. Uh, I think that attitude is is paramount. A good attitude is paramount. Working on the little things that you think aren't consequential, but they are. Working on the small things. I think kindness is something that students should be aware of. Uh, we are so engrossed in social media, but so much of it is unkind. I think we need to be more kind to each other. These are things you learn as you get older, hopefully. Uh, but kindness is, is, a, is a commodity that we don't have much of these days. So I would say good attitude, be kind. Uh, also, don't be afraid to fail. It's okay. Uh, I'll share you, since we have half of us are trombone players, <laughs> And, 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 and uh, a third of us are viola players. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, share this with you. When I finished my undergrad, my trombone teacher was uh, a retired second trombonist from the Chicago Symphony. And he was very, very good. You know, Chicago Symphony has one of the best brass sections out of all the professional orchestras. And so after four years of lessons, my very last lesson, he looked at me and said, Paul, you've done a great job. And at that point, I was principal this and principal that and conducting this. And so I, I was Mr. Big Man, you know, I, I, I was so just in my own mind, I was just very wonderful. And then he said, you know, you're going to be a great teacher and a great conductor. And I said, thank you. He said, you know, you've made every single mistake anyone could ever make. And then you've corrected it. Well, I was upset with that. He said, no, some people don't make mistakes. They just do things naturally. But if you've made the mistake and you've corrected it, then you have the ability to help someone to do the same thing. So when you're teaching, you need to, you know, you have to have the ability to say, yeah, I made that mistake and this is how I fixed it. So I was upset with him. 
uh, for, for, for saying that. But as I was teaching, I said, oh, yeah, well, try this. Oh, try that. Yeah, I made that mistake. So mistakes are just opportunities for growth. Uh, you become, you know, don't be afraid to make a mistake. Make the mistake, but then fix it. Find someone who can help you fix it. Because if you don't make mistakes, it means you haven't tried very much. So I, I would say, uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Uh, don't be afraid uh, to say, uh, I need help. How do I fix this? That's my advice for, for students. We've all made mistakes, but the people, first somebody said, every great professional was once a beginner. And so everything they do correctly, they, they did it wrong at some point. So make your mistakes, learn from them and move on. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I just, I was going to flip the tables real quick and give our educators here a chance. Uh, if I can ask you for a question. Oh no, you don't want <laughs> that. <laughs> That's Dr. Jensen. Always the teacher. <laughs> Uh, well, because your students are going to see this, and so I was just thinking, um, I loved everything that Dr. Cobbs just said, and I don't have uh, anything to add that. So I just had a question for you all, and thinking that the students might like to hear your voices. Um, what's the first thing that you would like to say to all your students when you get to see them again? I would just like to say how much I miss them. I really do. Miss them so much. Miss seeing their faces and making music with them every day. That's what I would say first thing. I mean, I say it every time I send an email or put a post a message. I miss you guys so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yes. it's just not. It's not the same. So that's why. Yeah. yeah, those are the same words that popped into my head. Also, is is I miss I miss you, um, and uh, in the midst of rehearsing and being perfectionists and trying to get everything exactly right. I don't take enough time to tell them how good they are and how much they matter to me. So I'd like to say that to them. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of piggyback on both of Rebecca and Megan. Just you know, obviously, I I miss the I miss the heck out of my students. Um, just seeing their goofy personalities, <laughs> you know, just. <laughs> It's not necessarily the music. It's just like the goofy personalities and the the weird things that they say during passing period, you know, and when they're packing up, just kind of those weird things. But also, I guess, kind of a bigger message, and we all know this as musicians, how we deal with a lot of adversity in our professions, um, both as musicians, because we're constantly striving to be the best that we can be. But I think just this time away from you know, just away from our routines, there's a lot of adversity that we're all facing. And I think hopefully we'll all be better people because of it, kind of taking that approach. So hopefully that's, hopefully that's the message we all take away from this. I, um, I miss my kids and I miss the, the, the little rituals and uh, routines that we develop. Um, and I'm to answer and to answer your question, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to stand in front of a group of my students and give them a big smile, which I start every class with. And I, every single class for my whole career, I've said good morning and I greet them with that. And they say good morning back, even my 12th graders. And I say happy whatever day it is. So today I would say after having greeted them at the door with a little fist bump, Rebecca do it with me, I bump them and we blow it up once and we bring it back in, but we don't blow it up a second time because that's just awkward. And I say, good morning and happy Monday. And then the learning proceeds from there, the other learning. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> so my, my Monday morning message I sent out today through Canvas was, good morning, happy Monday. <laughs> Here's your work. Excellent. Well, I said this a second ago, but this has been an absolute delight to get to visit with you two um, and uh, uh, for fun. all of us to visit yeah. together. So uh, um, good to see you guys. Can I say one last thing? You guys want to talk a little bit about for a few minutes, talk about camp and 
what things are what things might be happening hopefully in camp what's what's the plan for this year do you have an invitation for our students who might not be involved in the symphony yet mm -hmm. yeah we're working on everything right now and kind of patiently waiting to see what the governor says and what our universities say who are our hosts um uh, regardless of that, we are moving forward and are planning for an Evergreen Music Festival this summer. Yes. Um, and so as as things proceed, we're hoping and I don't know, Dr. Cobb, what do you think, like the next three weeks or so that we'll be able to have a lot more information for yes. everybody. Um, yes. But there there will be some there will be summer learning and there will be some version of the Evergreen Music Festival. Um, right now, we just need to sit tight to officially see what that's going to look like, but we 100% have an intention to engage with students this summer and to have a music festival. And I think Dr. Cobbs can speak a little bit more to that. Yes, we are looking so forward to that. And especially because we feel gypped by not having rehearsals for the last, you know, um, couple of months or so. So we can really make up for lost time this summer. And we invite everybody to come and, and be with us. I warn you, you might like us so much until you decide to join and, and come for the full season. Uh, we are very welcoming. It's like a big family uh, when students come and they're new they're always welcome they they make new friends and uh so it's a great way to have a uh, musical summer and to make new friends to learn a lot and see what the uh, youth symphony is all about mm -hmm. yeah and we also plan to have season auditions as well and yes. in august and so um, if people aren't able to join us for summer camp, we'll, you know, be in August getting together and doing auditions. We welcome you. We look forward to seeing you. Absolutely. Thanks, you guys. Look at Ryan's cat. It's so cute. It's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> well, appreciate you visiting with us this morning. I know our students are going to appreciate it as well. Well, so. thank you. Yeah, and thank you so say much. Say hi to them all for me. <laughs> well, and if you guys don't mind, we might, you know, post some pictures or post parts of this video, if you don't mind, maybe on our social media pages or Canvas pages for our students. But... That's great. Okay, Absolutely. Great. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks so much. Right. Bye. 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 Thanks, you guys. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you.